welcome back to my channel. I'm your host, Stephen. In today's episode, we'll be learning about how to measure the curve of a mouthpiece using the Morgan Mouthpiece Measuring Tools or other measuring tools you can get on the market. So don't forget to give a thumbs up, subscribe, like, and share afterwards. So now, before we start, don't forget to watch my other previous episodes about the table, mouthpieces, ligatures, reeds, because those will all be important as we learn more, and future episodes about the mouthpiece table variances and reed and ligature interaction with those curves. Today, we'll be measuring up three tenor sax mouthpieces, my personal ones. I'm using tenor mouthpieces because they're large and we can see them easier on the screen. But we'll also be doing alto saxophone and also clarinet mouthpieces in future episodes. This may be a bit boring, but it is very important as you learn to reface mouthpieces and you learn more about the player interaction with the ligature, the reed, and the curve of the mouthpiece. So before you get bored or click out, you may want to go to the third mouthpiece. But first, we're going to do the Woodwind K5 mouthpiece, then a Selmer Larry Teal, and then a Selmer D mouthpiece. The standard CS80, I think it is. We'll get right to it right now. So what we have right here is we are using only five measuring gauges for the curve of the mouthpiece using the glass and also the tip wand. And I have a block here so we can understand making sure that the tip and the glass is equal. So we're gonna start now with the woodwind mouthpiece. This is a woodwind K5 tenor sax mouthpiece. If we take a look at it, you can see it's a large chamber, has deep cut out sidewalls and a slight rollover baffle. This is a nice deep, Sounding tenor sax mouthpiece. It is in its original form, I do believe. We'll take a quick picture of its table in a second. We can see its table looks really quite original. We can see how it's kind of cut from bottom to top. Looks like there was some adjustment to the tip and rollover baffle there a bit in the past. I haven't touched it. You can see the original K5 stamp right there. A really nice mouthpiece. I really love playing. It's really dark. So what we want to do first, we take our glass gauge and we want to make sure it's up against the tip. Now I brought this here just to show you that we want it to be up against the tip. If it's too far back, these numbers will give us the wrong numbers. If it's too far up, of course, those will give us the wrong numbers too. So we need it right at the tip. Also, this glass gauge has two lines going down the middle. This allows us to kind of look at and center it on the mouthpiece table. We can take a look at the window. You know, if it's skewed, we can easily see it's skewed. We can try to adjust it, get the lines up to where the tip is. We want to hold it. Nice, even pressure. Feel it there. Put it against a flat piece if you want. Make sure it's flat. And then we'll get to measuring it right now. First, we're going to use the 0 0.05. This comes out to an even 10. You can see that there. So we know what that is. Next, 0 0.034. Comes out to about 18. Each mark you see here is two. So at 10, you got the next mark is 12, then 14, 16, 18, then 20. Now the 0 0.024 of an inch. Takes us to about 24. The zero one inch. Oops, I moved it a bit. Takes us to about 34. Now, I already know that these, both the left and right rail are even. If they weren't, 
this would end up skewed a bit. And we visually see that and we write down both the numbers. Basically, I, I write down the numbers. I already went through them. You can see right here. 015. Take us all the way down to 48 about. Of course, you take the tip wand. Make sure this is up and even. Tip one would take us to about see 170, 180, 187 about. It's really easy once you get to doing it. Um, I'm kind of standing up, bending over a table here. So I already took measurements sitting down comfortably. But to get used to this, you want to do this over and over. Take the glass off, put it up here. Make sure you got it centered on the mouthpiece table. You know, and do your adjustments if this is your first time over and over and over again. Make sure you get the same numbers again. Make sure you're able to put the tip and the glass equal to each other. It becomes really simple. Next, we're going to take a look at a Larry Teal. Once you can see the LT right there. This is basically straight sidewalls, a minor rollover baffle, and it has a, you can see looking down there, a circular throat. We'll take a quick look at the, the rubber on the table. You can see it looks pretty original. Now you'll see some discoloration here, green and black streaks. Matter of fact, the mouthpiece is slightly discolored. Green down here, black up there. See more discoloration down here. Really nice mouthpiece. Next, we have a Selmer S80D mouthpiece. Take a quick look at its um, table. We have here is a standard square throat. You can see the square throat there. Minimal, if any, baffle and mostly straight sidewalls, though it does curve in a little bit, just ever so slightly. And let's take some measurements here. Point zero 0.05, comes up to about 10. Now there's one, I want to mention something here, is if we look at the lines, you'll see it's not quite symmetric, this line hitting the window and this line hitting the window. This window actually is not symmetric. It has a nice curve from here, but then the curve is different. It's more straight line up to the side rail here. So this back of the window curve is not symmetric. So when you go and put the glass on, these lines are not going to be symmetric to where it touches equidistant from the curve of the window here. It's more like kinked. You got to be aware of that and compensate for that. So I look down here, see if that's good. That is good. To here, it does look good. Mention start 0 0.50, come up with 10. Next one is 16. Next one is about 21. Next one is about 32. Next one is about, oh, what happened here? Oops. I shifted my finger back by accident. Let me shift my finger forward. 
now I get a different facing. So as far as it goes, if I rotate my finger back, this goes all the way down here. So what's the problem that we have here? We have a table that is not flat. When you have a table that's not flat, your facing curve measurements are going to be very inaccurate. Because what happens is the reed will come here and interact with the table. And what makes the reed interact with the table? It'll be your ligature. So now the ligature is going to have pressure points on this. And depending upon what part of the table is not flat, may change the way the reed interfaces with the curve. And if it's not flat left to right or top to bottom, that could really make the, the reed be at an awkward angle. And if people ever really have to crank down the ligature so that the reed plays well, more than likely the table is not flat and or the side rails and tip. If you can get away with lightly tightening your ligature, more than likely the table is flat. Now I do have an episode about different ligatures and how they pressure point on the reeds that doesn't cover the table though, but it gives you a good indication. For instance, if we had a concave section here and we had a ligature like this one right here, this is the original one, I forgot what, what it was called. I can't read the small words anymore. But basically, you look at this and there's four points of contact for the reed on the ligature. So if there was a table problem up here and was high, the reed would get pushed and bent up. If you had a ramp back here, like my last video had, the reed would get like this and then the ligature bend it down and create this flex and make it harder to play. Now your embouchure has a lot to do with it too. If your embouchure pinches up here, you're going to close the reed down and make it actually a smaller tip than what it's designed for. If you play back here, it's going to keep the tip the way it was designed for. So many players who say they sound the same on multiple mouthpieces usually don't take in enough tip. They say they do, but of all the players who have actually taught and saw this, they don't take enough tips, even though they think they do. So there's a lot of things to learn from that. We're actually going to take this mouthpiece and flatten the curve in another episode. First, we're going to figure out what the problem is, then flatten the curve as an example mouthpiece. Now let's take a quick look at some charts for these mouthpieces. What we're looking at here is the woodwind mouthpiece. Now I put the numbers of the left and right rail here. They were even, if they were off canter a bit, they'd be different numbers left to right. I put the tip opening up here. I put which feeler gauge I use. With this one, we're just using only five feeler gauges, the standard one with this kit. I use up to eight at sometimes. The larger the mouthpiece, the more feeler gauges I use. Then we have an average and we have a radio setting here, which is mathematics based upon the numbers over here. And the blue is the radio. This meaning it, this is more or less the perfect curve that you want related to the tip opening and starting point. And the red is the curve of the mouthpiece. Now, if you think about this, if your embouchure hits this first red where the mouthpiece is, it's going to squeeze it down. And basically the facing curve becomes a lot shorter. So this is where your embouchure and how much where your lower lip is positioned on the reed plays an important part in how the mouthpiece is going to play in relation to the player. So we always have to remember that because like I mentioned before, many players don't take in enough mouthpiece and they squeeze it down where the tip is only partially of what it was measured at. That's why many players sound the same on different mouthpieces and different horns with different mouthpieces. So we gotta understand that. And if the rails aren't 
a good curve, that means the reed has to bend differently. It's a piece of wood, a piece of softened wood from your spit, basically. It has to bend on that curve. So it has to bend on that curve consistently so it can vibrate up and down near the tip of the mouthpiece. Now with the reed too, you have the spine. Depending how thick the spine is, how far up it goes closer to the tip, can define how it bends. With longer, smoother, less curve, with less tip opening, you can use harder reeds. This is where the strength of the reed comes into play, but also the way the player's armature is. If the player's armature squeezes it near the tip, it doesn't matter what it is in essence. So we all have to remember all that while we're working on mouthpieces. And this is where your ability of play testing the mouthpiece comes into play is you have to play test the mouthpiece to the way the facing curve is. If you, if you test it with your embouchure, lower lip near the tip, it doesn't really matter at that point. You got to push your lower lip out further down the facing curve and play it that way. If you look at some of the great tenor sax players, Try to wash your armature, wash your lower lip and its position. I'm going to try to find the video I'm thinking of where um, one of the greats lower lip was way out on the lower mouth. You can see him doing vibrato, not up and down, but front to back. And his he would position his lower lip in different locations and change the tone. So this is the woodwind and these are the numbers here. I'm going to try to make this spreadsheet available. I'm going to try to convert it to Google Sheets. This is in Excel right now, but I may just make the Excel one available. On the Larry Teal mouthpiece, we have the numbers here, left and right, feeler gauges here, average left to right, and the radio numbers. Tip opening up here. That's what I got. And we see this is fairly consistent, except the tip opening is a little bit more than it would be from radio. But playing wise, you know, you use a little bit softer near the tip. You may sandpaper the tip a little bit, make a little bit softer on the tip or a little bit softer on the sides next to the spines of the reed. And we'll talk about reed maintenance in another episode. And the uh, Selmer D was basically kind of whacked. It depends how you measured it. Depends where I put my thumb, thumb depend how I rocked the glass. It can be all over the place. I mean, I had 45, 45 as a second measurement. But what we had is we had 82 when I rocked my thumb back because the table wasn't flat. So you can see how this affects the ability of creating a more or less good measurement and good adjustment on the mouthpiece if your table isn't flat. Now, I had one episode about the ramp, which is where the back of this kind of sticks up. I'm going to have another episode about it being concave and convex in different parts here. Um, that's up and coming. So make sure you continue watching. And you can practice this all yourself. Of course, when you practice measuring, you want to practice over and over and over again so you're consistent at putting a glass on the mouthpiece and measuring it properly, making sure the glass is on the tip and being able to measure consistently over and over and over again. I know there's a lot of information thrown at you today. I want to thank you for listening. Any questions or comments, please post them down below. Don't forget to give a thumbs up, like, share, and subscribe. You got to love knowledge, got to love life, and got to love mouthpieces. We'll see you next time.